Well, uh, welcome from my side. Uh, thanks for uh, showing up um, right after lunch break here. Um, this is uh, uh, the second session of mine, as many of you uh, will be aware. Uh, Josh Long and myself did uh, Reactive Spring as a more like live coding oriented session yesterday, uh, which is kind of a companion to this session because we're going to look at Spring Framework 5 from a more strategic perspective and from a more overall perspective. Um, I am going to come back to the reactive programming topic, of course, in the course of this talk, but only really as one of several major themes uh, we're going to spend equals amount of, uh, equal amounts of time on uh, the other themes. All right, so uh, um, just uh, framing where we are. I'm going to get back to the roadmap anyway at the very end, but uh, we are currently in the release candidate phase. So this is, of course, a talk about uh, a generation of the framework which is still in the works. Uh, we are currently working towards 5.0 RC3. Uh, in, we intend to go final towards the end of July. Uh, we're going to get back to that, but keep in mind uh, it's still a preview release at this point, a preview generation. All right, so where are we production-wise? Uh, just a very quick summary. We did Spring for Photo 3 last year. Spring for Photo 3 wasn't actually planned. We only meant to do a Photo 1, a Photo 2. Uh, we do feature releases roughly every 10 months. So it, this is our current model. We will keep that up. Uh, Spring Framework 4.x was a perfect, a perfect example. For the 1, for the 2, for the 3, were all very rich feature releases, um, bringing literally hundreds of uh, minor refinements in every every one of those releases. Um, I guess other projects would call them 5.0, 6.0, 7.0 in the end these days. Um, but we prefer to use the major version number as an indicator for a an overall revision of the entire framework of the entire code base, a raising of the baseline. So we, we, we'll get to that. 4.3 did not raise any baseline. It works within the Spring Framework 4 architecture and with the, the Spring Framework 4 system requirements. Works on JDK 6, 7, and 8. Uh, still works on Servlet 2.5 containers. So um, it's just a feature release in the 4.x line. And it's designed as the last one. There's not going to be a 4.4. 3 is now in maintenance mode, and um, um, was our, it was essentially our final opportunity last year to bring new features to uh, your production environments immediately, even to JDK 6 and 7, but of course also to mainline JDK 8 usage of 4.3. And this was the driving, the driving factor. We did a few things, um, just as examples for, several, for literally 100 plus things, but uh, the sort of thing that we bring into feature releases like 4.3 is uh, driven by the easiness of the implementation, right? Can we straightforwardly roll this in without major, major re-architecture? Can we uh, bring this into the existing programming model? So uh, one of the little revisions in 4.3 is indicated here. Um, the auto-wide annotation on a constructor in a single unique constructor arrangement is not actually mandatory anymore in 4.3. So if there's a single obviously dependency injection oriented constructor, we do not insist on the presence of that auto-wired. That's particularly useful for classes which otherwise wouldn't even have annotations on them or no spring-specific annotations on them to support uh, the uh, uh, auto-wire pattern against a single constructor out of the box. Um, there, there, there were ways of configuring this up front, but this is basically the default behavior in annotation config mode now. Uh, on, a, on a related note, also for the three refinement is the ability to define in, um, dependency injection constructors on configuration classes. It actually looks like a very obvious thing to do if you see it like this here. Um, but previously, for technical reasons, the CGLIP subclassing of configuration classes, you couldn't actually have a freely designed constructor arrangement on a configuration class. Uh, now you can. You can have, this, you have the same flexibility, including the flexibility to avoid at auto wipe on a configuration class uh, in a scenario like this, injecting common references and using them in uh, the actual ADB methods. So those are, those are changes that we brought into 4.3. As I mentioned, 4.3 wasn't actually planned, 
but we figured that there are such convenience refinements like these here that we can easily bring into Fold Up 3 and so that they don't have to wait for 5.0. Fold Up 3 is a sort of early, almost an early backport of features that could have ended up in 5.0 only, but were easy enough to bring into the Fold Up X line still. So one, one more example, this is actually, well, that's a kind of Spring Framework Fold Up 2 oriented um, controller, WebMVC controller with a few endpoints, nothing out of the ordinary, but uh, using a few recent things. What we did in Fold Up 3 is to introduce variants of request mapping pre-composed mapping annotations, get mapping, post mapping, patch mapping, delete mapping, um, and put mapping, the, those are essentially just using the power of Spring Framework 4's composable annotation model. So in, in Spring Framework 4, you can build your own annotations uh, by crafting an annotation type of your own, meta annotating it with certain Spring annotations and kind of combining the semantics of those Spring annotations onto a type of your own. These annotations here, get mapping, post mapping, and code that we decided to ship in Fold Up 3, uh, do not have direct support in Spring MVC. They just use the decomposable annotation model. So they also serve as a reference example for what the annotation composition model allows for. And they're pretty convenient in practice because the Java annotation model has a few, well, limitations, right? Um, you have to specify the names of every attribute here, in particular if it's more than one. Whereas if you can reduce the typical need to one single attribute, uh, you can declare the denotation to accept that without a name. So in the get mapping, post mapping case, simply speaking, we decided to roll the uh, HTTP method into the annotation type name, leaving usually just a path, maybe a produces condition as well, that sort of stuff, as a, as a need to be explicitly declared, significantly reducing the uh, length of the mapping definition. So that's also in Fold Up 3. And uh, so much for the, for the examples. Um, this is the sort of refinement that we tend to do in feature releases. It's actually pretty, pretty common stuff. Many modern day uh, Spring projects use those features. We've seen broad adoption of both the annotation free uh, single constructor scenario and of the new MVC mapping annotation. So both of them are pretty popular. Spring Framework 5, of course, takes all of the goodness in Fold Up 3, uh, but comes with a different perspective. It brings a new baseline after about uh, three and a half years, it brings a new baseline to the Spring world. We're finally raising the entire code base, um, the entire set of Spring projects building on Spring Framework. We bring all of them to Java 8 Plus. This is the most significant uh, upgrade we ever did because we're actually skipping seven. Uh, Spring Framework 4.3 still works on Java 6 and 7, and we're basically skipping a 7 plus baseline, moving straight to 8 plus. Uh, at the same time, we also raised the Java EE related specifications to the Java EE 7 level. So uh, we require Server 3.1, Beam Validation 1.1, JPA 2.1 now. Um, they are basically four years old, released about four years ago in 2013. Um, common enough these days that we can require them. Whenever we raise the baseline, we also look forward to the next generation of what, uh, what's coming there. So we have, of course, um, a, we spent a lot of time with JDK 9 and prepared for JDK 9, and um, we have invested into the JDK 9 um, story. But uh, we also look at Java E8, at Servlet 4, at Bean Validation 2, at uh, uh, the JSON binding API, for example. So all, all of this comes in Spring Framework 5.0, a raising of the baseline, but also support for the next generation of the baseline. So it's JDK 8 and 9, Java E 7 and 8 already. Um, it's worth noting, of course, that JDK 9 is not out yet, um, and Java E 8 is not actually released yet either but very close. Uh, Java E8, the Java E8 specifications, intend to go final in July, so in time for the Spring Framework 5.0 release. So uh, we are going to ship production support for it basically from, from day one. Uh, if, you, if you have a provider implementing those, right? Uh, Tomcat 9 is going to be final soon. Habinet Validator 6 may still take a while, but certainly happening this year. Uh, for JSON binding, it's the Apache Johnson project already having released a, uh, uh, their their final implementation of uh, the spec, right? So these things are, 
are, of course, significant factors in anything that we do. Imagine, imagine the impact. We, we are literally touching almost every source file in the Spring code base. Whereas from an application perspective, it's a little different. Um, you already had great Java 8 support in Spring Framework 4. Um, fine, kind of wrapped up in Photo 3. Uh, so we were already supporting a lot of Java 8 constructs, almost everything you would want to do. In your code, we reflectively detect that you are using Java 8 features, that we're on Java 8, and do everything we can to provide a fine, out-of-the-box development experience with Spring Framework 4 on Java 8. In Spring Framework 5, we can internally use Java 8 constructs now. So within the Spring code base, we are going to see um, use of lambdas, method references, a hard exposure of types like completable future, uh, zone date time, um, uh, uh, the Java util function interfaces. So it's primarily a benefit for us at that level. Uh, but of, of course, the integration with JDK 9 and Java E8 is also a benefit to you uh, in case you are an early adopter of those upcoming uh, generations. Right. So let's go through some of the major themes one by one. Um, let's start with JDK 9, since we already talked about it a little. Uh, a bit of a deeper dive in terms of the motivation of what we're doing there. Um, I guess that's, that's the trend that the JDK 9 talks at this conference anyway, to uh, see JDK 9 as a very worthwhile upgrade, a very worthwhile new generation of this core um, infrastructure that we're using beyond Jigsaw. So, um, of course, there's the module topic, right? And we're, I'm going to, to give you a brief insight into what we're doing with, uh, uh, with uh, running Spring on the module path in just a moment. But the main point here is, the main takeaway is, JDK 9 is the next generation of the core library and language that we're using, that we're all using. JDK 8 is going to see its end of public updates sometime soon. We, we have to put JDK 9 onto our upgrade roadmap. And also from, a, from, a, from an ecosystem perspective, from a community perspective, we have to put ourselves into a position where we are able to upgrade to a new version of the, a new generation of the JDK rather quickly, still at an individual pace, but at least with a plan. Doesn't mean you have to upgrade this year still, right? But put it onto your agenda, put it onto your roadmap, consider the upgrade, try the upgrade, put it onto, on, onto next year's agenda, have a plan for it. So there's a lot of goodness in JDK 9 in the end. Uh, I particularly like the, uh, the runtime enhancements, uh, the, uh, uh, the compact strings arrangement, the, uh, the stuff that they did around the segmented code cache. There's a lot of transparent goodness where, at least in principle, you can take existing applications, run them on JDK 9 in the class path, ideally, and enjoy the runtime benefits that JDK 9 brings transparently for your existing applications. That's great, right? It's, it, that is the number one uh, recommendation. If, if you deal with JDK 9, first of all, stay on the class path. You're going to have a smoother experience. Um, but try to run your application, ideally with the latest versions of the frameworks and libraries that you're using, on JDK 9. Don't even use the Java 9 language level. Compile with target 1.8, deploy it to JDK 9, and see, see how it goes. Do a little bit of load testing, uh, check the memory profile of your running applications. There might be significant benefits even just by using JDK 9 underneath. And maybe fine tuning the garbage collection setup and uh, et cetera a little. All right, JDK 9 is currently scheduled for release now in uh, uh, late September this year. Um, I personally hope that's actually happening, but I guess it has uh, the best chances even with the Jigsaw reconsideration ballot not, not uh, having happened yet. So if everything goes through, in politically, basically, then we will have JDK 9 GA at the end of September. That's actually after our Spring Framework 5.0 GA target date. Uh, but that's nothing unusual. We have been supporting Java 8 three months before its release. Spring Framework 4.0 went final in December 2013, and JDK 8 went GA in March 2014, three months later. Um, that's okay for us. We ship early support for JDK 9. It's not a moving target anymore. We know what we're dealing with. We are doing everything we technically can at this point of time. Um, but of course, if you want to use Spring Framework 5 on JDK 9 in production, you'll have to wait for JDK 9 to go GA first. All right. The, um, 
the jigsaw topic, um, we have been tracking this for a long time in the spring world. Um, so we are testing on JDK 9 for like one and a half years at least and have been involved in the early Jigsaw discussions and also in the late Jigsaw discussions and all the issue resolution discussions lately. We have been providing our input, we have our perspective, but in the end, we are very pragmatic. We see Jigsaw as an opt-in uh, mode of operation on JDK 9. You can choose to deploy your arrangements on the module path, in particular for embedded arrangements, uh, not applications of arrangements. So if you choose to do so, you, you opt into a uh, different mode of deployment with certain, um, well, enforced, uh, enforced boundaries at runtime, but also with uh, enforced validation of what you're actually deploying. The module path has strong benefits. It will, it will immediately fail if, you, uh, if the same package is defined in two modules, or if you have an overlap, basically an unintended overlap. Whereas the class path is totally lenient. The class path is just a flat arrangement of, of jars and directories. The, the class path doesn't, at, uh, in class path mode, the JVM does not retain any structural information about what you deployed. It's literally just a flat long list. Whereas in the in Jigsaw, in the module path world, the, there, is a, there is a runtime representation, a structural representation of what you deployed. The JVM understands the module boundaries. Uh, you can also reflect upon those module boundaries at runtime. So tools, but also potentially applications themselves, could reason about the, uh, that, that those structural boundaries, that structural information, the dependency graph between the modules. Uh, that is, at least in principle, a really good thing. Um, all the implications with uh, certain things not being visible anymore, reflection into application modules being significantly harder now, um, that is basically the price we are paying for a formalized uh, enforced module system, or, uh, for a formalized module system with enforced boundaries between the modules. We prepared uh, the framework, the code base, as far as we can for JDK 9 Plus, uh, not just for the module system, for everything that's uh, deprecated or comes with different recommendations on JDK 9. We also um, test on the module path quite regularly. You need some tweaking. We, we test uh, third-party dependencies as well. There's some tweaking needed there. As far as we know, there's no tweaking needed in uh, Spring Framework itself. We're currently also investing into Spring Boot to become fully JDK 9 compliant out of the box without any extra command line flags on, on the JVM. So um, there's still some way to go, but from a Spring Framework level, we've done everything we can. The existing Spring modules, uh, Spring Context, Spring JDBC, Spring WebMVC, as you get them from Maven Central, we are using those as our modules. If you put those char files that you get from Maven Central onto the JDK 9 module path, they work out of the box. Uh, at the moment, we don't actually declare module names for those, so the module name is derived from the jar name. We like those module names as they are derived from the jar name. It's basically uh, for Spring JDBC, the jar name is Spring-JDBC, and uh, the algorithm in JDK 9 for an unnamed module on the module path is to drop version information, replace dashes with dots, that's the module name. So that would be Spring.JDBC, like seen down here. That's a perfect module name for us. Um, at this point, we intend to, uh, for the final 5.0 release, we intend to ship manifest entries that hard code those names so that they are not derived from the jar name anymore, but that Spring JDBC jar actually has an automatic module name entry saying my canonical module name is spring.jdbc. So we are following the, that naming policy, but if you rename the jar files, you still have a stable module name to work with and to declare, because that's essentially what Jigsaw is about and what our Jigsaw story is about. It enables you, at least as an option, to declare module descriptors in your jar files to turn your application jars into modules, have a formal module descriptor, express dependencies on the spring modules, and uh, have a formal visibility graph to those modules. So that's what we intend to enable. And that works at least fine enough, good enough for the time being, uh, with us in automatic module mode, because that's what JDK 9 essentially does to a jar file on the module path if that jar file does not have a module descriptor compiled in. It has an automatic module mode where it infers information from the jar file itself. 
with the, the present set of spring jars on the module path, that's exactly what's happening. We can provide stable module names in that arrangement through a manifest entry, but we're not going to ship module descriptors in addition. Module descriptors in your application jars is a different story. That's what you can perfectly do right now. And you can also choose to conceal certain packages, to export certain API packages, and to not export certain internal implementation packages. So you have all the power of the Jigsaw module system in your hands. From, um, from a framework perspective, uh, we are going probably going to ship module info descriptors at some point when we require JDK 9 at least, uh, but more like a Spring Framework 6 thing. Um, and we do not intend to actually conceal anything. In the uh, Spring Framework jars, and in particular in the core framework, everything that is public is public for a reason. Either because it's consumed in some applications or in some third party libraries, in some extensions, in some integration arrangement. Um, so anything that's not public, uh, like package visible implementation classes, we have plenty of those, is already not exported. And everything that's public probably will have to remain exported anyway. So uh, whatever we do, even in the future, um, expect the current um, public surface of the framework to re essentially remain compatible, to remain the same, um, even, even once we start shipping module descriptors in the future. But once again, the main point is you should be in a position to choose to use module descriptors in your application jars. Frameworks and libraries need to participate in that arrangement, and we're doing everything we can um, to play along uh, in such an arrangement already. All right, so a, a sort of related topic, and let's keep this somewhat brief uh, because I want to talk a little bit more about functional afterwards. Um, HTTP2 is a key topic in its own right. Um, I mean, I've been pitching HTTP2 quite a few times now. I, I truly believe that we as a development community in the Java world need to be in a position where we are upgrading to industry standards such as HTTP2 in a reasonable time frame. This is the first revision of the HTTP specification in 20 years. I mean, how did we even survive with 20, 20 years without a revision of this central communication protocol that we're all using every day? So by all means, it's out there. It's final. Um, many stakeholders did their job, both the browsers, the mobile browsers, a lot of the network infrastructure. It's mostly constrained by the servers. If a client comes along and says, I want to talk HTTP 2, but the server says, nope, HTTP 1.1 is it, then we are to blame. If we are implementing Java-based servers, not talking HTTP 2, we are taking away this efficient communication channel, this efficient communication variant from all the clients who would be happily talking HTTP 2 to our systems at this point already. This is a typical Java problem, I would argue. We are always waiting on somebody to do something before we think we can do what we need to do. So uh, at, at, in this world, we are waiting on, on Servlet 4.0. Servlet 4.0 is an important step to take, don't get me wrong. Spring 5 has explicit Servlet 4 support. We support everything we can in Servlet 4. But it shouldn't serve as an excuse, because Servlet 4 essentially doesn't actually do that much. It requires, it mandates HTTP2 support. It doesn't mean that you couldn't have HTTP P2 support with servlet 4.1 already. And you, you perfectly can because all the HTTP2 benefits, well, almost all of them, are largely transparent to a servlet-based application. So why not make use of that transparent benefit? Keep the existing code in place, the existing frameworks in place. Just enable HTTP2 at, uh, with your HTTP server and uh, everything from headers uh, compression from the symbolic header references, the, the channel, uh, the connection multiplexing, um, the binary representation on the wire, all of these benefits come transparently. The, that's actually a great, a great asset, right? It's actually quite nice that the servlet API can so easily deal with this. So let's not wait for servlet 4 containers. Let's research the, the uh, uh, opportunities that we have already. Tomcat 8.5, JD 9.4, Undertow 1.4, they, they all come with instructions on how to set them up with an HTTP2 ready protocol stack. You will have to modify your JDK installation, bring a TLS stack onto your existing JDK installation. It is doable. There are different ways of getting it done, but they are all documented. All the, uh, all the aforementioned servers come with recommendations on how to do it as long as you are in control of your JDK installation. 
All right, and of course, once Servlet 4 is available, there's nothing wrong with an early upgrade to, for example, Tomcat 9, providing a full Servlet 4 uh, HTTP 2 ready experience out of the box. And there's also nothing wrong with trying to combine this with a JDK 9 upgrade, because the protocol stack in JDK 9 is more up to date and ready for HTTP 2 out of the box. So you, you don't necessarily have to modify uh, it the same way unless, I mean, there might still be. There might still be uh, uh, some servers uh, uh, not requiring, but suggesting uh, some update in the protocol stack. But at least you're in a better position to start with on JDK 9. All right, so from a Spring perspective, we have early servlet 4.0 support, but we in particular have strong and ongoing integration efforts with uh, the most recent generations of Tomcat, JD, and Undertow. Um, this applies to both the framework level to even the uh, uh, web reactive level, and also to Spring Boot in particular. All right, let's move on to functional API design. As mentioned at the beginning, Spring Framework 4.3 wraps up an annotation-based story. It fine-tunes certain elements of the annotation-based programming model in Spring. Um, that's a very important step to, 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 to take, right? This kind of wrapping up. We see it as a when nothing's ever done in this industry, right? But we see it as a, a very comprehensive, quite complete model in the meantime. Uh, we are still fine tuning it. There are actually several uh, changes to uh, the annotation based component model, quite a bit of fine tuning in 5.0. But in the end, it's not our main area of, of, of focus in 5. In Spring Framework 5, we choose to take a different perspective. We look at the framework from a more a programmatic usage model from a functional usage model. What if you wanted to, uh, to set up an entire Spring application without the use of annotations, um, without the use of reflection, possibly? So we're actually taking this pretty far. We're not saying you have to look at it like that. We are, we are just challenging our arrangement, our framework, from a, a somewhat extreme perspective, like no, no reflection, uh, in order to fine tune the overall arrangement to allow you to craft, for example, smaller microservices, highly efficiently tuned uh, without annotations, uh, possibly even without reflection. And there's another very important driver, and that's the Kotlin language. We uh, provide first-class support for Kotlin now, first-class both in terms of an inspiration for our API design efforts in 5.0. We always take the Kotlin perspective into account, no, and next to the Java 8 perspective. But we, in the meantime, we ship uh, uh, quite a number of Kotlin extensions out of the box. So if you're going to consume Spring Framework 5 modules from Maven Central, those canonical jars uh, come with Kotlin extensions that by convention the Kotlin compiler can pick up automatically. Those are a couple of overloaded methods with uh, Kotlin functions and K-class signatures. It's a really, really nice mechanism that Kotlin provides us with. So. Uh, I'm going to show you an example for Kotlin just in a moment. Uh, the reason why we, uh, we love Kotlin, why we choose to focus on Kotlin, is, uh, is, is many, manifold. It's a really nice language. Uh, lot, I'm not going to elaborate too much on the language design. Um, we mostly love, I personally mostly love, working with the Kotlin team. It's a very active development. They, they really take into account that Kotlin is being used with Java frameworks and libraries, and they go out of their way, improving that story, making it more idiomatic, allowing us to provide a more idiomatic Kotlin story. So that's really great. And the Kotlin extension mechanism is a, is a fine example for that. Another example is Kotlin support for nullability annotations. So in Spring Framework 5, very recent effort, we uh, declare a non-null API convention any, any parameter, any return value that is nullable in regular scenarios is marked as at nullable. That's fine for, uh, for IntelliJ. IntelliJ is going to you know, flag a warning in your code when you are making a non-null assumption about something that can be nullable. So it even helps in IntelliJ. It even helps with uh, working in Java. Uh, it helps with find bugs, right? You can run a find bugs build step trying to find uh, potential bugs in your code uh, where you may be missing a non-null check or um, any other violation of, of the rules. But for the Kotlin compiler, it's even better. In, uh, the Kotlin compiler takes those metadata annotations into account 
allowing you to assign the outcome of a Spring Framework API call to a non-null reference in the Kotlin language based on the nullability declarations in, uh, in the target calls, right, in, in our code, in our code base. So that's the sort of thing we, we love as an outcome. We can take measures in the Spring code base itself, making sense with the Java language, making even more sense with the Kotlin language, and making sense with tooling and uh, um, uh, with IDEs as well. All right, so for the functional API design in particular, um, we are inspired by Java 8-isms, the Java 8 collection stream API, uh, the related kind of design, API design perspective that, for example, RxJava and React are take. And of course, Kotlin comes with really nice support for functional APIs, for functional invocations, so we also take that as an important inspiration. From a Java 8 perspective, for example, there are many things you can do in, uh, all over the framework now, but for example, even when you're registering beans, you can do um, things like this. Set up a generic application context. Do not send it on a class path scan. Do not register annotated classes. Register classes with the new register bean variants. If you want to do anything other than calling the default constructor, provide what we call an instance supplier. So what we're seeing here is a register bean variant that says, like, I'm registering a bean of that type. Whenever we need a new instance of that type, say for a prototype bean or a scoped bean, we are uh, even for a singleton bean, but it's, then it's just one instance at most, we're going to call the provided supplier. So this is literally uh, a Java util function supplier. You can pass a uh, Java 8 lambda or a method reference into, uh, into that call, of course. So what we're doing here is just a programmatic representation of the, the bean's construction rules. If you want to obtain dependencies and pass them, for example, into the constructor of bar, you could simply call back to the application context with retrieval methods uh, allowing you to easily grab target references and pass them in. There's still a little bit of potential for uh, a more streamlike uh, uh, retrieval uh, arrangement, retrieval API, but this is what we have at the moment. If you want to fine-tune the bean definitions, um, there's actually an optional var arc of bean definition customizers, which is another lambda. You're basically saying, here's, here's how you need to create instances, and now for the outcome, for the bean definition that you're internally registering, your generic application context, please do this to the bean definition. Set the lazy init flag. You can provide any number of inline lambdas setting metadata on the bean definition. So it's n it nicely integrates with the bean definition metadata model. Underneath the covers, um, it is essentially a, a revision of the container architecture with first class support for instance suppliers. So that we're very efficiently dispatching straight to the instance supplier if we can. But it's, it's still the same rich and very flexible bean definition model underneath the covers. So it's kind of the best of both worlds, I would argue. It doesn't take anything away from being combined with XML bean definitions even, but in particular, annotation-based bean definitions. If you want the annotation-based features activated, use annotation config application context as a starting point. It has the same flexible functional register bean methods where other metadata, other than the instance supplier rules, is still being taken from annotations, but you can kind of programmatically specify the construction rules in combination with this. There's also a nice little twist here. Uh, this is a method reference to the default constructor on the foo class. The difference here is that we are literally not using reflection anymore. Here there's technically, I mean, it's basically class new instance, there's, there's technically reflection at work. If you choose to specify an instance supplier, even for the simplest construction rules, this is a straight invoked dynamic dispatch to the uh, target constructor. There is literally no reflection involved. All right, and in Kotlin, the same example can look like this, right? Um, Kotlin has quite a few variants, uh, but the, the above example is essentially the same that we've seen before. There's... Um, a few nice little Kotlin language features shining through here. Uh, most importantly, the, uh, the instance supplier here, the, it's basically a, uh, um, a, uh, a, a function with reified generics. We can reliably infer the return type of that function. 
So it, uh, in, in generic application context, there's a register bean variant, there's a Kotlin extension, uh, taking a Kotlin function and inferring the, the beans type that we really need to know for many reasons uh, from the return declaration of the supplied function. Whereas in Java 8, of course, in Java, uh, a, a generic callback does not actually retain uh, generic type information in a, in a reliable way. So we have to ask for an extra argument. You have to say bar class and here is how you need to construct bar. In Kotlin, using the, the capability of the Kotlin function design, you don't have to repeat yourself. You can, but you don't have to um, with uh, the, the bar argument. Uh, what we see down here, that's uh, our name for it, which is, uh, I, I tend to call this the Gradle style usage of Kotlin. Uh, the Gradle build tool comes with a Kotlin DSL and this is the sort of style that they're using. Um, so it's, it's the same example. Uh, but uh, uh, using uh, a, different, uh, um, a different combination of, of Kotlin language features, which you may or may not like, but uh, this is how far you can take it in the end. This is a little bit more traditional. Um, if, you, if you're coming from a Java perspective, this, this is a very straightforward translation of what you've been doing before. So these kinds of Kotlin extensions come in many places. We have them for, uh, for several of the template classes. We have them for the, uh, for the core container. We have them for Reactor. We have them for the uh, Webflux functional API. So in many places in the Spring Framework 5 effort overall, there are Kotlin extensions providing value like this. Overloaded methods where maybe an, an argument or two can be saved or where the, uh, the usage style can be more idiomatic using the Kotlin extensions. We really care for idiomatic usage. If you're a Kotlin user, you shouldn't feel like you're calling an old Java API here. It should feel like an API that's designed for you for consumption in Kotlin. And we have really have a great balance and uh, a great arrangement here in Spring Framework 5 in collaboration with the Kotlin team. Quite a few of those features in Kotlin actually emerged as we uh, um, discussed with them about what it takes to arrive at an idiomatic experience with the Spring 5. All right, so, and of course, the uh, uh, yesterday's topic of focus in the reactive spring talk is reappearing here. Um, let me take a different perspective, though, a slightly different perspective. We are doing this because the, it's the right time to do it. We wanted to do a, um, a reactively oriented uh, a web architecture before, but there haven't been enough pieces in place yet. And uh, this is certainly the case, uh, it's certainly different now. Everything's in place now. We have the reactive manifesto that led, basically suggested certain architectural qualities that we mean to achieve. For us, it's in particular about responsiveness and resiliency. Um, we're really trying to provide an arrangement, an alternative web stack, an alternative web framework um, with very predictable behavior under high or unusual or extreme load. Whereas in, in, in a server container architecture, there are limits, and you may not re ever reach those limits, but they are there. You may exhaust your server thread pool. If all your server th uh, request threads are busy, or busy waiting on something, uh, busy on waiting on an external system, your server container is literally unable to accept further HTTP requests. It may even reject the simplest index page requests at that point. In a reactive web architecture, everything is being turned around. We, are, we don't have a servlet request thread pool. We uh, have an underlying efficiently managed reactive kernel with a, a task scheduler uh, efficiently using the actual hardware powers. Uh, basically, the number of threads is the number of CPU cores, simply speaking. And uh, for processing an incoming request, we never assign a thread to it. We provide a reactive, compos a composed reactive pipeline. Uh, we leave it up to the runtime system to efficiently call this pipeline, this transformation pipeline back whenever data is ready to be processed. But our processing steps never own a thread. If we're currently waiting on an external system, we're just parked in memory, but no thread is blocked by us. We leave all the threads up for serving other clients at that point. Of course, the reactive manifesto uh, is only, it's just a manifesto, right? It's, uh, just a little bit of a, a statement of intent. But it actually led to a concrete initiative, and that's reactive streams. Reactive streams, um, a couple of years old in the meantime, is an initiative, a, col a collaboration between several stakeholders, like Lightband, the RxJava team, 
uh, our reactor team, at, uh, uh, which is largely at Pivotal. So the Reactive Streams initiative really led to a, like, like almost a movement. Many reactive data stores considering reactive stream based drivers, uh, reactive web frameworks considering a reactive streams based arrangement, RxJava 2 having been re architected, um, at least to have a reactive streams based variant of RxJava uh, out of the box. No adaptation necessary anymore. And Reactor, Project Reactor, uh, which is our reactive kernel of choice underneath Spring Framework 5 and has been shown yesterday quite a bit uh, in the Reactive Spring um, demo. So Reactor, uh, of course, has the benefit of late birth. It has been designed on a Java 8 Plus basis in Reactor 3. It has been designed on reactive streams from day one. So it's a, it's a very tight a kernel, a reactive kernel, focusing on the essentials of uh, what it takes to provide reactive processing capabilities in a Java server-based arrangement on Java 8. Whereas RxJava still has Java 6 and 7 compatibility, in particular Android compatibility, and RxJava 1's legacy in terms of the, uh, th the number of reactive types. Uh, React is just much more focused. As shown yesterday, it just has two types, Flux and Mono. We're going to see them in a moment. Uh, whereas RxJava 2 has uh, quite a few more. So one important point to make, a very important point to make, we are introducing the reactive capabilities in parallel to traditional servlet-oriented capabilities. In Spring 5, there is very first class, the Spring WebMEC framework, which remains the servlet-based web framework that you've been using already. It is, uh, it is of course, a, as far as, uh, as possible, compatible with previous versions of Spring MVC, just uh, minor revisions applied. The servlet API is shining through you can still declare an HTTP servlet request or servlet response in your handler method arguments. It is a servlet-based WebMVC framework with the annotation-based model as its primary usage uh, arrangement. In parallel to that, we ship a new web framework, a new module in Spring Framework 5 called Spring WebFlux. Spring WebFlux is based on a reactive HTTP abstraction using Project Reactor 3.1 uh, in, in, in its final version then, um, as its core reactive engine and also as the provider of the core reactive composition types, Flux and Mono. The uh, underlying HTTP engine is, uh, in principle, you know, uh, an SPI. In practice, we focus on support for Tomcat, Jetty, Netty, and Undertow. So there, uh, and th th that's where it becomes interesting, right? Uh, Tomcat, Jetty, uh, Undertow server containers? Well, they are. But uh, Tomcat and Chedi are essentially HTTP servers with a, a server personality on top. For historic reasons, the server personality is quite deep in those. But nevertheless, they are very rich, very powerful, flexible, and capable HTTP engines. And here, we are putting them into that position, an HTTP engine in a reactive web stack. So we are not using them as server containers. You can choose to use a server container, Tomcat or Chedi as a server container. You can also choose to build a reactive web arrangement with Tomcat and Chedi just as an HTTP, a reactively enabled HTTP engine underneath the covers. No servlet API shining through. You're just using the reactive web abstraction and uh, reactive composition types. No servlet API up there. Internally, whether those containers ship the servlet API does not matter. Netty, of course, is the is the reference example. That's what uh, most of the other reactive web stacks out there are using as the only choice. Net is certainly the most powerful and most capable, most configurable networking stack out there in the ecosystem. Um, that is great and is actually a key point of our offering here. You may choose to use Netty. That is kind of the default even at the moment at least. Um, or you may choose to use a sort of simpler HTTP engine, engine such as Tomcat or Chetty. It's your choice, depending on also administration and monitoring concerns. There may be many reasons why uh, you might go with Netty or why you might choose to go, for example, with Tomcat instead. And with Undertow, Undertow is the web server underneath Wildfly, the Wildfly application server. We actually mean Undertow core. So that's a fine example as well. We are not talking about uh, Undertow as a server container. Undertow separates its core HTTP engine from its server personality. And for usage in our reactive web stack, all you need is Undertow Core. All right. 
So finally, and to kind of connect back to yesterday's session in particular, um, I'm going to just give you a few brief examples of what this feels like in the programming model. A reactive web controller in its annotation-based incarnation initially looks like a Spring MVC controller, doesn't it? It's, come, it's, it's a regular uh, Spring-managed bean, uh, comes with a controller stereotype on top, uh, can, of course, do dependency injection arrangements, uh, comes with the same mapping annotations as Spring MVC, can even come with the same parameter annotations as Spring MVC. Um, well, that's, that's, of course, by design. The annotation-based usage model for the reactive web stack is syntactically aligned, as far as possible, with uh, Spring MVC's conventions. It those are literally the same annotations. They, they are literally coming from the same package. However, the purpose of those handler methods is different. In Spring MVC, a handler method is being dispatched to within a servlet request thread. You get the request, you're supposed to produce the response. So we call the, the handler method, and the handler method owns the thread until the response is done, simply speaking. It can instruct a view rendering, but essentially it owns the request thread until the response is done. These handler methods here are different. We dispatch to them whenever an incoming request matches, and we want a Reactive Streams publisher to be returned to us from every such handler method. So we are essentially asking the handler method to provide us with a, a processing pipeline for this request. But no processing actually happens yet. The handler methods just build a processing pipeline for the request, which is passed back to the runtime system. The runtime system, Reactive Streams enabled, is going to register a subscriber for it, a Reactive Stream subscriber for it, which is basically the HTTP response stream. And whenever we can start actually start writing out to the response stream, then and only then, our, our, our Reactive Streams publisher here is going to start doing some work. So it's a very lazy arrangement. It's also uh, participating, of course, in, in Reactive Streams flow control model, in this back pressure model, where we are not pumping data to the HTTP response if there's currently network congestion. We only start pumping data as far as the network stack can actually pass it on. And also on the other way around, if the data store is slow, if we currently can't get any data out of the data store, the publisher is also currently not able to publish any elements, the subscribers just parked somewhere in memory, not occupying a thread, and whenever data actually arrives as it arrives, we reawake the subscriber and pass those elements back to the response stream. So it's flow control in both directions, for very fast publishers and for very slow publishers, and for network congestion on uh, the response subscription. All right, so what we see here are those aforementioned types flux and mono. Flux and mono are the two um, uh, primary uh, uh, reactive types in, in the reactor library. Uh, they essentially correspond to RxJava single and RxJava observable, if you're used to RxJava. Or you could argue this is sort of a reactive variant of Java Util optional, and this is sort of a reactive variant of a Java Util stream. Both of them are Reactive Streams publishers, literally. They implement the Reactive Streams publisher interface. You can choose to return any Reactive Streams publisher to us. So if you have a target library, a repository that you're calling that happens to return RxJava observables, that's okay, pass them back to us. We know how to adapt them to our runtime arrangement. So this is actually a flexible signature. We suggest the use of mono and flux. You can also choose to use RxJava 1 observables, for example, or RxJava 2 flowables. Uh, we support them out of the box. So it's, this is very driven from, from your repositories, from, from your target processing logic upwards. Our reactive web framework, web endpoint framework, is motivated by the powers of the underlying data store. Whatever you do to actually arrive or process at your data, um, if this can be done reactively, if there's a reactive data store driver for your data store of choice, you can expose that reactive power straight up all throughout the stack up to the web endpoints. This is a key point of why we're doing Spring Web Flux. All right, and there's a syntactic variation also shown yesterday. Instead of the annotation-based model, you can choose to use a functional uh, model where uh, you're basically building router functions and handler functions. This is a very different usage model. You're basically saying, um, I have a programmatic route here. Whenever a matching request comes in, dispatch to this 
target method, and you're using a Java 8 method reference, in this case could be an inline lander, to actually call the target method, which is aligned with the handler function interface. So in order to use a method reference, um, the signature needs to comply with handler function. That's a server request going in and basically a server response going out. Any number of routes, you can nest the routes, you can have uh, an arrangement where you compose from several routes. It's a very flexible arrangement, but it comes with uh, a different trade-off. The annotation-based model is highly decentralized, works really great for a lot of endpoints across many controllers, whereas this is a tighter arrangement where you are in control, where you can centralize the routing logic, maybe even in a single bootstrap class. Um, it, this is more microservice-oriented for sure, works great in particular if there is a small innumerable number of, uh, of routes to, uh, to declare. It also doesn't come with flexible signatures, it can't you programmatically need to interact with the given server request and literally produce a server response. So, for example, the path variable arrangement, um, a flexible signature that gives you a pre-resolved path variable as a long, doesn't really fly here. Uh, you programmatically need to ask the server request for the path variable and process it as you need, uh, as you need it to pass, to, for it to be passed on to the repository underneath the covers here. We've seen more of this uh, uh, yesterday. So, there is a Kotlin variant of this, which I'm not showing today. So you could also use this functional model with a more functionally oriented language such as Kotlin. That's a particularly great experience and also one of the reasons why we do the functional web endpoint model to begin with. All right. Um, and this is, of course, the inline Lambda version. So that's just what you're seeing here is just Java 8 language features combined with functional API design that takes those language features into account. So very naturally, you can choose to use method references here or inline lambdas as you prefer. Same applies to Kotlin functions when using Kotlin. All right, so much for the uh, end of this tour. We're already slightly over time. Um, let me just summarize once again where we are. RC3 coming out soon in Spring Framework 5.0. GA target is end of July, coming with everything I've mentioned today. Uh, actually, almost everything I mentioned today is in RC2 already. Um, RC3 is just a little bit of fine-tuning, and we uh, intend to go GA very soon after. Connecting back to yesterday's session, you may want to use Spring Data K for the reactive repository model that it brings, supported on Mongo, Cassandra, Redis, uh, Couchbase. This is currently in milestone. Uh, still, it will have an RC1 out soon, probably uh, shortly after Spring from Mac 5 or RC3. And the most complete package, of course, is Spring Boot 2.0. If you want to get started with this today, go to start.spring.io, choose Spring Boot 2.0 M2, um, and let it generate the project for you, setting up all of this stuff with Spring Data KM4, Spring from 5.0 RC2 underneath the covers to get you started with a reactive web stack very quickly. Spring Boot 2.0 will take a few additional months still. Uh, so there's going to be a milestone three in July. Um, we intend to have a release candidate in roughly October and a GA time frame in November, late November at this point. So we do take some extra time for Spring Boot because Spring Boot comes with a lot of dependency management. We need final versions of some reactive data store drivers and several other dependencies. So it is waiting to some degree on some external efforts uh, to properly materialize still before we can pack this up into this really coherent uh, and well-aligned stack that we aim to achieve here. While Spring Framework 5.0 on its own and Spring Data on its own will be complete and production ready for you uh, in summertime already. All right, so thanks for your attention. Uh, thanks for your extra attention, uh, uh, the, the few minutes over time that we have here. If there are any remaining questions, um, please, uh, after the BOF and the session yesterday in particular, please come up to the stage or catch me out, uh, out in the hallways. Um, I'm around uh, and I'm, of course, very willing to talk to you about everything around uh, Spring Framework 5. All right, so thanks for your attention. Um, enjoy and uh, um, try start.spring.io. Thank you. <laughs>